So I'm, I'm a software engineer. Uh, actually, who is software engineers? Who here are software engineers? Not surprisingly, for the people watching the video, a lot of people are software engineers. Um, I wonder if you had the same misconception that I had going into the industry. I thought that a software engineer was someone who went to work every day and sat quietly with nobody talking to them and wrote code for like eight hours, maybe with a break for lunch, maybe not, depending on how good the code was, and then they went home again. Out of interest, is anyone's job like that? No? <laughs> kind of. I've got one kind of from the room. Um, well, whoops. Yes. Um, it's not really a thing. Coding is a surprisingly social job. Um, and coding is an important skill for a software engineer. I'm not denying that. But there are a lot of other skills that we also need. There are a lot of other things we do every day. Like, um, we spend some time noticing what our coworkers are doing. Noticing when other people are blocked, for example. Um, we hopefully have some idea of what we're working on. Um, we're, we're coding something in particular. I mean, not always. Sometimes we code for the sake of coding. But most of the time, we have a plan of some sort. And we want to make sure that the plan is the right plan. Um, there is an important skill in software engineering, which is onboarding new people and making them be productive pretty quickly. Uh, there's a skill of making sure that the team has a roadmap and a plan and that it's up to date and that other people understand it. Um, I call all of this stuff glue work. It's sort of technical leadership. Um, so we get some signal for it when we're interviewing senior people. If we interview senior people, we ask things like, how do you decide what to work on? And do you, on a day-to-day -day basis, know what you're doing? And how do you make other people better? But sometimes a team ends up with someone who is junior, but who happens to be good at this stuff already. And we haven't inter interviewed them for it. We just kind of got that for free. Um, I, I call them people who are senior before they're senior. Um, this kind of work, it makes the team really better. Like, it's important. But people aren't always rewarded for it. In fact, doing glue work too early can be career limiting, or it can even push people out of the industry, which I think is really weird. It's like um, we lose good engineers because they happen to also have this other set of skills that we also want. Like, we're probably not doing that right. Anyway, hi, um, my name is Tanya. I'm a principal software engineer at Squarespace in uh, lovely New York City. Um, I, um, where is Tanya? On Twitter and GitHub, and I blog at noidea.dog, which is, of course, a Squarespace site. Um, I am uh, from, I live in New York, but I'm originally from Ireland. Um, my accent will come in and out, but mostly in right now because my kid sister is here. That's my kid sister in the front row. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, when you talk to someone from home, you, you go right back to your childhood accent. It's a funny thing. Okay, today I want to talk about glue. Um, here is our agenda. I'm going to tell a story about somebody whose career is hurt by, hurt by glue work. Uh, it is not exactly a true story in that it was originally about 10, glue, two, 10 through stories mashed up together. And since I've given this talk a few times, I've had emails from a ton of people and uh, DMs and LinkedIn messages, which is a weird thing, um, people saying uh, that this was their story too. So it's um, both not a true story and an incredibly true story at the same time. OK, then we're going to talk about fairness, both in the outcome of the story and in how work is distributed in general. Then we're going to talk about whether and when to leave the individual contributor or IC career path and do something else, like become a manager, a product manager, a project manager, a technical program manager, uh, some, some other role that, is not, um, that doesn't have engineer in the title. There are, if you look online, there are a ton of opinions about how to make this decision. And I will give you one more. Um, <laughs> um, then we're going to talk about how to frame your work if you've been doing a lot of glue, um, and how to make your impact visible, or how to help your coworkers if uh, your coworkers are gluey people you're working with. And then finally, I want to talk about learning and growing, because I don't think our industry talks about learning, which is weird, because we're doing it all the time. OK, story time. Imagine, once upon a time, picture a software engineer. Here she is. This is her first day in a new team. She's been out of college for a few years. She's had a couple of tech jobs. She is not wildly confident in her skills, but she likes the work. Her new code base is kind of hairy, and her changes take a long time. This is really normal. Um, but everyone's busy with their own work, and nobody thinks to reassure her that everybody is slow when they meet this code base for the first time. She's kind of feeling like she's working too slowly. 
Like she's needing too much help and asking too many questions. Spoiler, there is no such thing as too many questions. Um, after a few weeks, she thinks maybe they regret hiring her, but they're all too polite to say. But then she gets her first win. An internal customer comes in with a request uh, for data that the team's API really should have been able to provide. But the team just hasn't prioritized this feature yet. Um, so our friend here, she spends a few days just manually pulling the data for the customer and figuring out how to do it. Um, and she documents how to do it so that the next customer who comes along with this kind of request can help themselves. Um, the team stops getting so many interrupts because customers can help themselves now. The customers are really happy. The team is really happy. This is for her first unambiguous win. She feels good. OK, back to the difficult code. Now, a while later, she gets talking to someone on a nearby team. This team sort of nominally is supposed to uh, work together with the, the project that her team is doing. But she discovers that they're not all really on the same page about what problem they're all solving. They're going in a different direction. So she sets up a meeting with the system designer on her team and the lead of the other team. And she sits in the meetings with them. She asks a lot of questions. She asks the same question several times from different ways. She writes down all the answers in short declarative sentences um, and sends around notes afterwards so that everybody knows what they agreed. The thing changes direction. Now everyone is working together and they're building something better. New people join the team. She remembers her terrible first few weeks. And she writes a bunch of onboarding documents. And she sets up a mentoring program so that everybody, not just on this team, but across the whole of engineering in this company, will get a mentor from now on. Now, the company keeps having outages. And they're often attributed to lack of tests um, in the code base. So she gathers together a bunch of people who are more senior than she is. And she gets them all to agree on a, a, like a, a coding standards document. This is how we write code at our company. It includes a style guide, which makes uh, code reviews become faster because the code is in a consistent style. This works. Um, code is more tested. There are fewer rollbacks. Now, the manager of this team has a bunch of teams and is starting to rely on our engineer friend to know what's going on with this team. The manager is like, hey, awesome coder seems blocked. Do you know what the deal is with that? Now, she doesn't know what the deal is, but she goes to find out what the deal is, and she discovers that Awesome Coder has some information that he needs. Uh, but he's stuck in one of those email threads of death that have been going back and forth for three weeks, where nobody's quite explaining the thing they want. And they just keep talking at each other. Um, awesome Coder doesn't really like talking to other humans. So he hasn't walked up to the people he's talking to, who sit several desks away, to be fair, uh, and asked them for the information that he needs. Now, our friend here doesn't mind talking to humans. So she goes and asks the questions. Um, finds out the answers, writes down short declarative sentences, which I swear to you are my answer to everything, um, and brings the information back to Awesome Coder. He says thank you. He writes thousands of lines of code, and the thing ships on time. Now, since uh, she has a lot of state on the project now, she writes documentation and a launch plan to help the thing get out on time. And it does. It's great. Right on time. Well done, Awesome Coder, everybody says. And two years pass like this. Our engineer keeps vowing that she will write more code soon. But every day, something more important comes up. <laughs> the team has started to treat her as an unofficial lead, because she's got a really broad view of everything that's going on. Uh, she can sort of see the negative space between the designs and see what work needs to be done, should be allocated to people. She has one-on-ones with everyone at this point. She's basically mentoring all the new people. When she does her free time, it's this. It's an hour or two between meetings. Um, uh, the idea of swapping code into her brain for two hours and then going to a meeting, this is really painful. This, this is a picture of my calendar, by the way. It is like one hour blocks here and there. Um, but she's not worried because everybody keeps telling her what a great job she's doing. Um, her manager always gives her glowing performance reviews. What she's doing is important work. And in fact, she feels like in the last while she's gone up a level. Let's see if her company's promotion process agrees. Who should we promote? Well, obviously, we should promote the person who wrote all that code. Well done, awesome coder. The thing shipped. And we should promote the system designer. He did the design for the thing and made it integrate so well with the stuff that they were building on the other team. Uh, well done, system designer. And that's it. She's like, wait, what? Why not me? Why don't, don't I get promoted this round? And they were like, well, your project's not finished. You're not producing a lot of code. You just didn't have much impact yet. It's like, well, I decreased onboarding time. 
I made us build the thing that integrated with the thing the other team was building. We were going to build the wrong thing, and now we're building the right thing. That feels impactful to me. Our customers say I'm the only person that helps them. I did that thing with the coding standards and the testing guidelines, and the site's not broken as much anymore. I review all of our design documents, and the comments I leave and the questions I ask make us build better things. And they're like, yeah, that's great work. But what was your technical contribution? It's like, wasn't, wasn't that technical? I mean, it wasn't code, but not all technical things are code. And they're like, look, you're great at communication. Your soft skills are outstanding. We just don't think you're an engineer. Maybe be a project manager instead. So is that fair? Like, our engineer did important work. At every point, she looked at the things that were available to do, and she chose the most important, highest priority work that was available. The project legit wouldn't have shipped without her. She was the glue that held the whole thing together. Over the last two years, she got really good at technical leadership, at understanding the problem domain, at understanding people, introducing standards, making designs better. But she legitimately got no better at coding than she was two years ago. What do we do with this? So it's a sort of a difficult question. Um, I, like, I like to ask people to vote at this point. Um, who, um, you're on this person's uh, promotion committee or equivalent. Who thinks yes? This is a, the promotion is from mid-level to senior engineer. Who thinks yes for senior? Senior engineer. Senior engineer. That's like what's that? Maybe a third of the room. It's difficult, right? Who, who thinks no? Who thinks no? It's okay to say no. People are often scared too. But I'm not going to yell at you or anything. <laughs> Um, that's like five people said no, and a lot of people thought no, but they didn't believe that I was going to yell at them. Um, who is extremely on the fence and conflicted and just feels bad? Okay. <laughs> yeah, OK. Um, I'm really conflicted by this. The one thing I'm certain about, though, is that her manager bears some responsibility for this difficult situation. Because there was a communications breakdown. This shouldn't have been a surprise. This engineer got glowing performance reviews. She legit believed that she was on the path to senior engineer. And there's a funny thing here where if she had been at senior and she was going for the next level up, say staff engineer, she probably would have gotten it. Like, it wouldn't really have been an argument. Um, this is definitely technical leadership. But the company doesn't consider this work to be promotable from mid-level to senior. Uh, although they didn't explicitly say so, they want code at this level. They want quantifiable technical work. And her manager never told her that she was doing too much non-promotable work. Because honestly, the manager was probably just glad that the work was getting done. Because it's necessary. Glue work is the difference between a project that succeeds and a project that fails. This is why uh, TPMs, uh, technical program managers, and project managers make such a difference. They do the ultimate glue role. They see the gaps, they see what needs to be done, and they fill them. In teams without a project manager, or, or without a program manager, what happens? Well, in some teams, the manager takes up the load. In others, a manager doesn't want to do this kind of work or is too busy, and the work gets spread among the people who are willing to do it, or the people who are expected to volunteer for it. So I read this article about volunteering, hbr.org. There is an accompanying 35-page study, if you uh, enjoy reading longer studies. Um, the articles show that when there is non-promotable work to be done, women volunteer to do it, 48% more than men. But they also found that men volunteered less when there were women in the room. Uh, <laughs> they found that in all male groups, they had no trouble getting volunteers. But if there were women in the room, the men did not volunteer. I find that amazing. I find that just outstandingly fascinating. OK, the even more interesting part was that when managers were asked to choose someone, to do work that was not career useful, like sort of thankless work or just generally non-promotable work, they asked women 44% more often than they asked men. I want to be clear that I'm not saying 100% of your work should be promotable work. I feel like that would not be a good way to live. Um, it is good to build auxiliary skills. And everyone should do their fair share of uh, taking out the trash or sweeping the floor or doing whatever is necessary to make things stay nice. Um, but a large percentage of your work should be the thing you're going to be evaluated on. If someone is doing really very little of their core job, then they're hurting their career. If you're someone's manager or coworker and you're seeing them do very little of their core job, you're kind of letting them hurt their career. 
Non-promotable work. It's one of those like one person's trash is another person's treasure things. Uh, like if you're, um, if there's an offsite to be organized, and you're an event coordinator, that's like that's pretty good. Put that in your resume. Organize this offsite. It is great. If um, you're a manager, you could kind of put a story around it being team building. You could be like, look how this team building exercise made us have a stronger team. That's good. If you're an engineer, it's just basically not promotable work. It doesn't help you in any way. Maybe you're doing, you're doing it because you know, we're, we're sharing out this kind of work, but it's not, it's not particularly useful to you. Um, where is this work that's genuinely not promotable for anyone, not useful? It needs to be shared like this. The manager or uh, the prog program manager or whoever is tracking the work for this team needs to track the, this non-promotable work like they track everything else and share it out deliberately. If it just falls how it falls, it's not going to fall fairly. I do invite you to take a moment to think about who's doing the non-promotable work on your team. OK, um, back to our friend engineer. So people are suggesting to her that she change to a role where the work she's doing would be promotable. And I feel like I've seen this a lot of times, where it's like you're doing work that is not going to make you succeed on your ladder. So change your ladder, change your, uh, change your, change your job role. There's not as much about, so change the work you're doing. Or uh, so, so we'll, have, we'll help fill in the gaps so you don't feel like you have to do this work all the time. And there's not so much about, so change how you tell the story of your work. Um, I want to talk about changing roles. Because I've heard a lot of articles, or read a lot of articles, about deciding whether to do a role or not. And most of them are people who are already doing the role, writing these kind of excited articles about whether you are cut out to do this role. Like, is if your, your ability to do it means that you should do it. Um, they say, can you handle giving feedback? Do you care about people? Are you a good coach? Then you should be a manager. Okay. Um, Say, can you put yourself inside the shoes of your customers? Then you are a product manager. You are. You just are. It is decided. And I think it's like those signs at carnivals where they're like, you must be at least this tall to go on the roller coaster. And you're like, I am that tall, but no, no, I don't want to go on the roller coaster. That looks horrible. Everybody is screaming. People are vomiting. I don't want to go on that thing. But it's like, I think it's the same with people management. <laughs> You're like, you must be this socially competent to be a manager. And I'm like, I am, but <laughs> that looks horrible. Um, I have my own metric for this. If you code, you get better at coding. Every time you code, you get better at coding. Sometimes it feels like you get worse, but then you get better again afterwards. If you manage people, you get better at managing people. So the question I always ask people is, what do you want to get better at? What are the skills you want to have? It's not about the skills you already have. It's um, the skills you wish you had. The vast majority of our learning happens on the job. But I see people not considering roles that they want because they don't feel like they already have 100% of the skills needed to do that job. I've had, in particular, a lot of uh, computer science uh, college students, uh, interns, tell me that they're not applying for programming jobs because they don't feel like they're really good programmers. And it's like, you're in college. <laughs> when, how do you think you're going to become a really good programmer? The vast majority of our learning happens on the job. They end up choosing a role that they don't want because they're scared of choosing the role that they do want or because someone else tells them that they would be really good at this other role. It's a roller coaster. Um, I always advise people to choose deliberately. Choose a role that will make you feel successful and happy and proud to say you do, not a role that will feel like the consolation prize for the thing that you actually want to do. Do a role you're excited by. Like, you'll learn to get good at it by doing it. I feel like we don't admit often enough that um, a lot of us aren't great at our jobs on day one. Um, probably most of us. We learn it by doing it. There is another consideration, though, um, especially when people make the decision to uh, move out of engineering roles when they're very junior, uh, even if, the, if they are moving towards something they're excited by. Um, when you take a step away from something that is considered more technical to something that's considered less technical, it closes doors. It's not fair, but it is true. Um, our industry biases are set up so that you really need to have a, a solid engineering resume before you take a non-engineering role. Because the moment you give up the engineer title, the moment the most recent job on LinkedIn doesn't have the word engineer in it, 
a lot of people in the industry will assume that you have no technical skills. Like, I don't know how this is supposed to work. Like you could have been an engineer yesterday and today you've changed your role to something else. And a lot of people act like your skills are gone forever. Like, that would be a weird way for brains to work. Um, and this is especially true if your job title is any variant on project manager. Um, a lot of people immediately assume that you're not good at technology. Uh, Kripa Krishnan, who is the legendary director of cloud product operations at Google, she's amazing, she once said that while she'd experienced some industry prejudice for being female and some for having an accent, it was nothing compared to the prejudice that she had experienced for being a TPM. I've seen a lot of people take on a role like that and find themselves, after a while, get pushed towards be being a non-technical program manager. It's like, um, you, you know, you haven't really had time to keep up your technical skills, and we're going to ask you to go over here and do this less technical project. And it's a sort of a step towards moving out of the industry and into another industry. Um, I've seen people not want to do that and look back at engineer jobs and discover that they can't get hired at the level of developer that they were when they left even if it was quite recent. Like, the skills have evaporated. And they come back in at a lower level than they've left because people don't believe they're capable of the job. They will invariably hear the three most infuriating words in our entire industry, which are not technical enough. Like, what is this? What is not technical enough? Like, it's so domain specific. How do you do anything actionable with it? Um, if you're ever, um, people in this room, if you're ever tempted to tell someone that they're not technical enough, like maybe, um, or, or to write up, maybe you're doing interview feedback and you want to say someone's not technical enough. Well, first of all, just don't, because <laughs> it's, it's not very useful. But secondly, just be really specific about what you mean. Um, be clear about what skills you think are missing. Like maybe you want to say, uh, we need our engineers to participate in technical discussions in design meetings, so uh, we would need you to have a more thorough understanding of the domain of insert domain here, uh, and uh, I don't know, to um, understand all of the nouns in this particular document. Like that's, that's something, OK. Um, or you could say, our senior engineers are all system designers. Um, we we would, would prefer if you could pass a good, an interview on distributed systems um, and just have opinions about the CAP theorem. And if you can do that, then we'll think you're technical enough. But otherwise, it's like, what do you do with it? What you're basically saying is, you don't seem like an engineer. Which brings us back to our friend here. Uh, two years ago, she joined as a mid-level engineer. And sp since then, she spent her time filling gaps that nobody else was filling to make the team and the organization succeed. And as a result, she's been told she doesn't have technical accomplishments. And she would like a promotion. Um, I want to talk about that for a second, because not everyone would like a promotion. Um, and I'm putting a lot of emphasis on uh, career advancement. It's cool if that's not a priority for everyone. That's totally fine. Um, but here is an explicit bias I have. I would like this engineer lady to both feel fulfilled in her job now uh, and to have long-term financial security. She would like to someday retire and buy a little boat. I know this about her. You don't. You know now. Um, <laughs> this, is her, this is her dream. I would like her to be able to have that. Um, so I want her to feel like she can advance in her career. Um, I don't know what her right career choice is. Like, really, only she could make that decision. She should choose deliberately based on what would she love to get better at? What is a job that she will feel happy and successful and proud to do? What doors is she comfortable closing, or at least making hard to reopen? And unfortunately, one more, which is where will she feel safe and supported? Uh, I wish that I could say the entire industry will make everyone feel safe and supported, but this is not always the case. If she chooses a role she's less excited about because she's surrounded by people who make her do her best work, can't judge about that. But I hope she gets to do something that she loves where she's also safe and supported. Whatever she chooses, I will respect her decision, let's be clear. But for the rest of this talk, we're going to assume that she continues on the individual contributor engineer path. Um, partly because that's the only thing I can speak knowledgeably about, uh, but also because I just don't have time to do a choose your own adventure uh, with uh, <laughs> career paths. So wouldn't that be kind of fun? OK, so she wants to be a senior engineer. And really, she's already doing most of that job. Um, but she's getting this not technical enough thing. What does she do? Like, what do you do if you're glue? Um, and what do you do if you're managing or working with someone who's glue? Like, how do you make them successful and not waste this incredibly valuable skill set? Here is a four-step plan. First off, 
there needs to be a really long overdue career conversation between this engineer and her manager. She needs to ask direct questions like, will I get promoted next round? Ask, then wait for, leave, leave a silence. Don't soften it. Don't say, you know, I'm just wondering because I hope you don't mind me asking. No, will I get promoted next round? Awkward silence. It's perfect. <laughs> she needs to ask, what work should I do to get promoted? And she needs to ask, is this work that I'm doing something that people will consider senior engineer work? And she needs to get the answers in writing. Again, short declarative sentences. Um, her manager needs to be honest and direct about this stuff. There can't be any more, no, no, you're doing fine. That's horrible feedback if somebody is not doing fine. Um, communication needs to happen, that's what I'm saying. They need to agree on goals. They need to make a plan, ideally in writing, and they need to check in at intervals and make sure that they're still on track. Second, job title. If she and her manager want her to continue doing a lot of glue work, which is a legit way to live, um, is there a job, is there a title that she can have that will um, give her a buffer against accusations of not technical enough? Like, can she become the tech lead? Um, people expect a lead to do a lot of glue. Um, uh, I think uh, career ladders can help a lot with this. Um, where you, you can say, uh, you, you can put glue work into your career ladder at various levels and make it clear like what else needs to happen. Uh, but um, but narrow, narrowing down what, what is expected from a particular job title, I think can really help people. Um, I want to talk about job titles, actually. There's probably a bunch of people in the room who are thinking job titles are stupid. I don't need them. Or, my job title is programmer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if you're a white or an Asian dude, people assume you can code. Like, it doesn't matter if you can. Like, you maybe graduated yesterday with a degree in architecture. Uh, <laughs> I don't mean computer architecture. Uh, or a degree, degree in law or something. People assume you can code. You walk into the, into the room, you sit down, at the, sit down at the table. People assume you know what you're talking about. The rest of us, we don't have to do it. We don't get that. We don't get that for free. We have to spend the first third of the conversation putting our credentials on the table and proving that you should listen to us. We know what we're talking about. A job title gives us that for free. It gives us back the first third of every meeting. It's really nice. Um, it gives us freedom to do glue work without people assuming that we're not technical enough. It helps. If you're telling, especially underrepresented people in your organization, the titles don't matter, you are doing them a disservice. Titles really matter. OK. Third, she needs artifacts of her work that show her impact and tell the story. Due to her work, due to her technical judgment, this project shipped. I mean, it's a way of telling the story, but it's also not untrue. Um, her manager should be telling the same story. If you see the situation where a glue person is the only reason something launched, publicly give them credit. Um, and not for helping. That's the most dangerous word, I think. Oh, this person helped. No, they led. It was technical leadership here. But she can help herself with this, too, by creating artifacts. So she should be creating and saving design documents that she wrote, uh, proposals that where she had the idea, meetings where she went into the meeting and afterwards took the, took the notes or uh, changed the direction that it was going. The meeting notes should reflect this. Um, group emails. Point-to-point -point emails are, are terrible. You, you have absolutely no evidence that you existed in the organization. Group emails. She should be doing things that show the impact of her work, that show that she was there changing the direction. Um, OK, so this still might not work. She might um, get a better job title, have a good career conversation, and uh, have a compelling story about her work. And still, six months later, the promotion people say, same thing again. Oh, still no promotion, still um, not enough technical impact. And in that case, I have a solution that is a bit cynical, that I hate recommending, but also I think is the only way forward. If you are not getting promoted for glue work, stop doing glue work. I mean, maybe temporarily. Um, do exactly the thing that is on the job ladder. Exactly. Even if it means letting more important things drop. So she should do some really easy to quantify technical work. Write a bunch of code that really anybody could have written. Um, write some designs. Um, learn how to performance tune the database. Do something that nobody could argue is not technical. Um, the key is she should do it even if she's no longer like the best person on the team to do that, even if she's kind of rusty because it's been a couple of years. Um, the thing is, though, that means she has to stop doing the other stuff. 
Coding and uh, performance tuning databases can't fit around a full calendar of glue work. You just can't do it. So I would advise her, until her promotion is through, to declare a lot of things not her problem. Stop interviewing. You can get out of it. Get out of it. Stop organizing offsites. Stop organizing the offsites. Stop onboarding. Stop fielding requests from users. Uh, stop anything that sounds like team building. Stop helping other people with their work. It will feel terrible. It feels horrible. But it, it's temporary. Archive your mail. Quit half of the Slack channels. Uh, don't curate the team roadmap. Don't comment on docs that are um, uh, not going to help you get to your goal. Hopefully, this is just six months of playing the game by the very extreme rules. Um, and crucially, and this is the hardest bit, don't catch things that are about to drop. It's difficult, but when you look around and realize the rest of the team is already doing that, it should be kind of inspiration. Take inspiration from the other people. <laughs> <laughs> and stop being the unofficial lead. I've seen a lot of people whose job, who's not job title, but they were kind of considered the soft lead or unofficial lead of the team. Don't do that anymore. And if you're in the same situation and you're the official lead, stop doing that too. And I hate saying this, and please forgive me, but if she does a lot of diversity work for her company, I would recommend she stop doing diversity work it's for a while. Getting promoted is diversity work. Being visibly successful is the most powerful diversity work that she can do. She can be the representation somebody needs. She can put glue work into the, uh, into the career ladder and make it clear that this stuff is necessary for higher levels. She can only do this if she has free time in her calendar. If you make a lot of things not your problem, you can go from this to this. Ideally better than this, but I had trouble finding a good screenshot on my calendar. <laughs> um, um, those big empty spaces in the calendar are good to block out for project work, for writing code, for writing designs. Um, for quantifiable technical work. And it's a fun thing where all of that work will have a side effect. Um, it's a virtuous cycle. And the side effect is that the person doing it will get better at doing code and design docs and whatever the quantifiable technical work is. The technical term for this is learning. The vast majority of our learning happens on the job by doing the thing. If the skills you wish you had are the work you're doing every day, it's really cool because you get all of this learning for free, and somebody's paying you to get it. It's brilliant. Um, every time you go to Stack Overflow, you just learn something. It's really good. Um, but for anything you're not repeatedly doing, it takes time. You have to go out and choose to learn it. That's harder. Even for people who are getting recognized for glue work, who want to keep doing it, I really still recommend you keep increasing your other skills. If you only do glue, you only get better at glue. Forever. You're making your team more effective, for sure, but you're hurting your future self. No matter what you end up doing, you're unlikely to regret feeling more confident in core technical skills. Um, learning. Learning is great, right? But our industry doesn't talk about it a ton. All that tech knowledge in people's brains, everyone here, all the tech knowledge that's in your brains, you've learned in some way. You've got that information. But I feel like I never see software engineers say, oh, I just spent like three hours really staring hard at this thing, and I finally understand how to, um, oh, I don't know, the various authentication mechanisms and Google APIs or whatever. Um, but they do it. They have to go do it. But it's like we don't admit it to each other. We enjoy like kind of the swagger in like, oh, yeah, I've always known this. I was born understanding like OAuth or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you're a senior person, a thing you could do that is extremely high impact is to show your junior people that you don't know things. It's really good. And that you're learning things all the time. Be really public about what you're learning. Uh, some of us have the amazing privilege of having free time to learn. It's cool. Like You can go home in the evening, you can noodle on code, you can uh, take a class, you can read, whatever. Um, but a lot of people have so many obligations that they have literally zero free time. Make it clear that it is OK and normal to learn at work, to learn during work hours. Um, I like to put learning things into my calendar, which is, a, which is public inside the company, to say, I am spending this block of time learning this thing that I you know, probably really should know. But at the end of it, I'll know. It makes it, feel, it, makes it safe for other people to say that they're just learning stuff. Um, it's, if you can help turn your company's junior people to mid-level people or mid-level people to senior people, that is 
some serious impact. And you can do it by helping them learn. Watch out for learning opportunities that you're wasting. If you're sheltering someone by always doing something for them, or if there's something that you just really know how to do, so you're doing it all the time, you're depriving other people of a learning opportunity. Like, if, okay, so if there's something you know how to do, and every time it needs to be done, you're the person who does it. A thing you can do that is also very impactful is to ask somebody else who would benefit from learning from it if they would like to take it over. And it will be frustrating because they won't do it as well as you will. And, and that's hard. And just power through and help them with it. Get them to block out some time on their calendar and learn how to do it. Give them your full support. Redirect people to them when uh, there are questions about it. We only get better at what we spend time on. And we do get better if we spend time on things, and not just technical things. My amazing colleague, Paulina, has advice on what she says when someone tries to push her into more humaning work than is good for her. They say, you should do this because you are so good at communication, which she is. Uh, and she says, yes, I'm good at everything I put time into. You should see me doing system design. <laughs> so while she's off designing systems, she's giving other people on the team a learning opportunity to become good at communication by putting effort into it. If you're a manager or senior people, I encourage you to help the, no the non-glue people on your team put effort into communication. It is something they're going to need to know how to do. Do you remember those uh, two people at the story at the start uh, who got promoted? The awesome coder only succeeded because someone else on the team went and talked to other people and broke him out of the email thread of doom. It would still be going on now, I swear to you. Um, he couldn't communicate well enough to ask another team for some information that he needed. And the system designer only succeeded because someone else on the team asked what they were building and what it was for. He didn't have the technical judgment to step back and understand how his system would integrate with uh, the plan of the rest of the company. Um, should they have been promoted? Are they really senior engineers? I don't think they are. And I don't think they will learn to be if people keep doing their glue for them. They will get better at what they spend time on. Vast majority of their learning will happen on the job. Um, if you're a manager here, and your job ladder doesn't require that senior people do this kind of glue, think about how you're expecting that to get done. Uh, and glue people, push back on requests to do more than your fair share of glue work. Um, put your effort into something that you want to get better at. Our skills, it turns out, are not fixed in place. We can be good at lots of things. We can do anything. That is all I have. Thank you very much. <laughs>